Hey, this is Pastor Rick. It is December the 2nd, 2024. And I uh, just wanted to come back online. I know it's been a while since I've done one of these, but I want to take the time to share with you some thoughts that I've been sharing uh, with my local church congregation where I serve as pastor in South Georgia. Um, I'm beginning a series called More Than a Baby. And when we're talking about the fact that Jesus is more than just a baby in a manger. I mean, the whole world seems to have idolized the scene of the manger. And, and I, you know, I, I, that's good, but we just don't want to leave Jesus there. And I think the world accepts Jesus in the manger because if they can confine him to that safe confines of a manger, there's nothing to be threatened by. There's nothing to be concerned about. Um, sweet little baby Jesus, right? Um, and if you can do that, then the reality is you are free to make Christmas into whatever imaginary, magical event that you wish it to be, rather than the incarnation of the Almighty God Himself in human form. And if you can do that, then you are left with not having to deal with the reality of who Jesus is and what it means if you reject Him in His full measure. Now, as we move through the journey of this thought of being more than a baby, there's the concept that I want to show out of Isaiah chapter 42, where he is God's promised Messiah. He's the one that God promised would come and deliver his people. Um, we also are going to look at the fact that he is the sacrificial lamb of God. He came to die for our sin. We see, we're going to see that he is the victorious Savior of the world, and you must trust him if you're going to be saved. And because of who he is in his eternal essence and nature, we know that he is the life-giving Lord. All who trust him, he said, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, most of us, when we think about Christmas, we think of, in particular, Isaiah as it relates to Christmas we think of Isaiah chapter 9, where the great prophecy is given, where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And that's kind of where we stay. That's where we anchor. That's where we, you know, kind of set up shop. And that's where we want to live. Um, but that same verse makes a major shift when it goes on to say that the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful. That means he's the miraculous one. He's counselor. He's the all-wise God. He is the mighty God, that same passage says. He's the everlasting Father. The child, who is the Son, is the everlasting Father, according to Isaiah 9 and verse number 6. And it says that he is the Prince of Peace. Of course, again, Christmas focuses on that aspect of bringing peace to the world. But as Christians, what we recognize, of course, is that Christmas is really more than just some romantic time of the year or some feel-good season where everybody sort of gets along. Christmas is actually the day that marks the arrival of God in human form. It marks the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ. And though he came as an innocent baby, he's way more than a baby. And as I said, Isaiah 42 uh, tells us that he is the promise that God gives us. And I'll show you what that means in just a moment. So he, when he comes, and because there is Christmas, that is a testimony that God is faithful to keep his promises, which is good news to us because it means every promise that God gives are yea and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Isaiah chapter 42, verse number one through nine, um, you want to be reading along so I don't have to spend all my time reading the scripture, but Basically, we have this tremendous announcement. Behold, my, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to who? The Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord God, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, 
to God, the star breather, the creator of the universe. He that spread forth the earth, he that molded the earth from nothing, and he that, and then and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk there. And so God is the star breather. He's the earth maker. He's a, a, a humanity creator and breathes life into them. All in verse number five. And it's that God that is making this promise that we're reading about. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee, referring to the one to come, for a covenant, the new covenant, of the people. For a light to who? The Gentiles. To open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, and them that sat in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So that's an important verse. Because God's saying he doesn't share his glory, and yet he does that with Messiah. Why is that? Because Messiah is he incarnate. So he's not sharing, so to speak, with another. He's sharing himself. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and I do, do and I, new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So God is making this promise ahead of time. So when we look at verse number one through nine, again, we see the great staggering announcement of God. Now we realize Isaiah 42, God is speaking to Israel. He has promised to meet their spiritual needs through the Messiah that is to come. That's what he's promising. But we know it's good news for us as well because he speaks of the Gentiles in verse number one and verse number six. And the Christ child whose birth we celebrate at Christmas time is the promised Messiah. Now notice in verse number one, he says, behold, that means to consider with amazement and with wonder, uh, intensely gaze upon this concept. There's staggering new development that God is sharing with us. And, and we are beholding in Isaiah 42, a uniquely special promise that comes directly from the creator, God, eternal, infinite one. Now, as we look at these verses, we want to note some characteristics concerning this heavenly good news, or specifically the promised one, which will help us to identify who Jesus really is. And you will see right here that he's way more than just a baby. He starts out by saying, behold, my servant. Now, he's referring to the one that he's going to send. Now, later on in Isaiah 42, he goes back and he refers to Israel as his servant as well. But in this case, he goes on to give some specific characteristics about the person who he is going to send in order to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so the question is, when he uses the term, my servant, do we have other biblical evidence that would indicate that this is referring to Jesus Christ that was born in Bethlehem so many years ago? If we go into the New Testament and we look at Matthew chapter 12, verse number 17, it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit on him and shall show forth judgment to the Gentiles. So uh, Matthew chapter seven or 12, verse 17, 18 is actually connecting us back to Isaiah chapter 42. And it is telling us that this Jesus in the New Testament that you see is indeed the Messiah that God promised back in Isaiah chapter 42. And of course, we know in Hebrews chapter 1, the, the Son who, the, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, being the very brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin through his offering, death, burial, resurrection, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, where he intercedes for us to this day, very day. So he says, behold, my servant, I want to show you this staggering announcement. I am going to send a servant, and he is my servant. He's there to do my will. And we know that Jesus' whole life was about laying aside his rights, according to Philippians chapter 2, in order that he might fulfill the Father's will on the earth. He became obedient 
even unto death for the purpose that that father had for him. So Christmas is all about the arrival and the fulfillment of God's promise to us. Notice it also says that he is the one whom I uphold. Again, we would ask ourselves, is this referring to Jesus? John 16, where Jesus says, I am not alone because my father is is with me. And though everybody else is scattered, every man goes his own way, that same verse says, he says, yet I am not alone because the father is upholding him. So I say that is referring to Jesus that we see in the New Testament. Then he refers to him as mine elect, mine anointed one. The elect is the idea of to be pl- well pleased with, um, the one who is to satisfy a debt. And the question again, is this referring to Jesus? I think it is, because if you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 18 to 20, it says, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now here's the idea of his elect. It goes on to say in verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, for the believer. Listen. So verse 20 is saying, God had a plan from the very before the foundation of the world, and that plan became manifest in the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we know 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4 says that while Jesus was disallowed of men or disapproved of men by men, he was chosen by the Father and he was precious. So I'd say Jesus is indeed the one referred to when he says he's mine elect. He said, he's the one in whom my soul is delighted. Matthew 6, or 3 tells us that it says that this is, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Connects the dots. This is referring to Jesus. He says also in Isaiah 42, I'll put my spirit upon him. Is that referring to Jesus? Yes. Again, Matthew 3 says that the, he saw the spirit when, when Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and lighting upon him. So yes, he put his Spirit upon him. Isaiah 42 is referring to the coming Messiah. New Testament reveals that it is Jesus. It's the one whom the Spirit lighted on in the form of a dove. And so we recognize all of this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the special relationship he has with the Father as the promised one, the fulfillment of the promise of God. Now, in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse number two, we recognize that it says that he will be, Messiah will be humble. He shall not cry, nor lift up his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. And so in this reference, we see that Jesus, or the Messiah, who who is Jesus, is going to be humble in his presentation. Now, again, this may seem elementary to you, but I think since the world is kind of fixated on baby Jesus in the in the manger scene, I think it's important that we make sure that we understand all of these uh, aspects and characteristics of who the Messiah is and, and relate to the idea that Jesus is way more than a baby. Don't let Christmas become an idol and an idle celebration of, of some empty, sweet little baby in a manger somewhere. He is God incarnate. He was in human form. Now, when Jesus showed up on the earth, he didn't show up to rant and rave. He didn't show up in pomp and circumstance, glitz and glamour. He was meek and he was lowly. As I mentioned Philippians earlier, chapter 2, he set aside his own rights and he went to work. He laid down his life for his sheep, for us. And he felt no compassion or no compulsion to promote himself. He was here to do the Father's will. Even during his trial, he remained silent. He was like a sheep led to slaughter. Matthew 12, again, tells us that he he didn't cry out, nor was his voice heard in the street. And 
So, though he was a baby, he was no defenseless baby. Though he was meek and mild, though he was quiet in spirit, we don't want to underestimate just exactly who he is. And his humility actually confirms the fact that he was God's promised one. And then in verse number three, we note that the Messiah was going to be gentle and compassionate. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Now, this passage really blesses my heart because we hear that Messiah has an attitude and activity towards those that he came for that was uh, both uh, compassionate, gentle, kind, loving, and he says that he won't he won't he won't uh, break or a bruised reed. And the idea is that a plant has been wounded and it's like it's folded over, but he doesn't break it off and do away with it. He heals it and he makes it whole. And the smoking flax is the idea. You know, you think about a a fire that's about to go out, a candle that the flame has gone out and the, the wick is just red hot and the smoke is just coming up and your life may feel that way. You may feel used up. You may feel, uh, you know, just completely at the end of yourself. That's a good thing. And Jesus promises, even though you may feel that way, he will not quench your fire. Instead, he will breathe life on you. He will fan the flame back in the candle of your life. Not only does the psalmist say he lights our candle, but I suggest he keeps the land uh, candle burning bright, right? We know that in Luke chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said, you know, the, 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 those that are whole, they don't need a physician, only those that are sick, those that recognize they have a need. And so if that's where you are, Messiah has come to deliver you, to renew your strength, to give you a new hope, to break, make your life bright again. Mark chapter 2 said that um, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so if you are, a, and you are a sinner, and you feel like you've been beaten up, broken down, your fire's about to go out in life, my friend, just turn to Jesus in repentance. He calls you. He's the great physician. He can heal you. Jesus is this Messiah that is promised to us. Um, we also see in verse number four, his determination. He won't be discouraged. He won't quit until he has brought forth judgment to the earth. He's set forth the standard for mankind and nothing upon nothing could keep Jesus from his task of paying the debt for us as sinners so that he might justify us and bring us back to God in reconciliation. He is determined. Then we see his assignment there in verse number five uh, through verse number nine. We see that, of course, that assignment comes from God the Father, who is the creator of all things, has the power, like I said, to breathe the stars into the universe, to make the earth from nothing, to breathe life into the dust of the ground and make human beings. I mean, there is nothing that he cannot do. And he says, I'm going to establish my work. Verse number six, Jesus is the new covenant of promise for the Gentiles to bring them to God. He is the light to the Gentiles. Verse number six, he is the deliverer who do, restores sight to those who are blind in their sin. He liberates those who have been bound up in their sin and been caught in the web of deception and are now, you know, imprisoned by it. He's come to set you free. You just have to turn to him and allow him, his life force to work through you as you put your faith and trust in him and then walk by faith. And then he gives a summation of the great work, I think, in verse number eight and verse number nine of Isaiah chapter 42, um, where he says, I'm doing a new thing and I declare it and I'm telling you before it ever comes about. So what happens then? Isaiah 42, verse number 10 through 12, gives us the idea that the announcement brings great joy to those that would hear. He says, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praises from the end of the earth. Uh, go down to the sea to, and all them therein, the isles, habitants there. Let the wilderness and the cities lift up their voices, the villages, 
Let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let, it, let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. And so the 10 through 12 to me is the atmosphere that is created from this announcement. And we know, of course, the announcement being fulfilled in Christ that Christmas, the event of the incarnation of God in human form in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ has set the world to singing. Christmas is a time of joy. It is a time of celebration. And when you consider what the Messiah is coming to do and the fact that he came to the earth to bring light to the darkness, freedom to the enslaved, sight to the blind, and a new covenant for those who used to be alienated, from the promises of God are now brought into unity with God when they put their faith in trust in the Messiah. And so the soul should be ignited with a sense of gratitude and praise, and we should sing all through the singing, all through the season. We ought to be filling the air with joy and, and great joy that overwhelms everything ought to be exuding from us, particularly if you have already embraced the Messiah. If you haven't, come to know him, man. He'll, he'll set your heart to singing. And so that's sort of the response. Sounds like Christmas to me. That's what we see. Joy fills the heart, fills our lives, fills our world, and the whole world sings, right? And so then we see the assurance of his accomplishment in verse number 13 to 16, where he talks about the mighty man stirring up the jealousy, man of war. Uh, he shall cry and roar. He shall prevail against his enemy, and his greatest enemy is death. Of course, the other enemies would be sin, uh, iniquity, transgressions. He said, I've held it my peace for a long time. I've been still. I've refrained myself. Um, but I will make waste the mountains. I will dry, dry up all the herbs, and I will make the rivers islands, and I will uh, dry up the pools, um, and I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I'll make darkness light for them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. What tremendous revelation we have. God warns against idolatry. All right? Or, I mean, not, not, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. That's later in verse number seven, I was 17. I was looking at it. But when I look at verse 13 to 16, I, I just want you to know that he's given us the assurance that he's going to do this thing, right? And it's going to be a spiritual war, but I'm going to accomplish this. You can count on it. And when God says he's going to do something, you can bet on it. He will prevail. And so when I look at verse 16 specifically, we can trust his guidance. He makes a way where there's no way. He assists us as we follow him, and he promises he will never forsake us. And we hear that over and over throughout scripture. God will accomplish his purposes for his glory and of course for our good. Hallelujah, right? And then we see the admonition that is given. Now this is why we need to never let Christmas become a form of idolatry. And for the whole world, it is so slowly shifting from Jesus as the center to everything else. It's a magical season. It's a romantic season. Uh, you know, movie channels have gone from Christ-centered to holiday shows to now romance-oriented holiday shows, and they're getting more and more perverted as they go. Um, but we are warned not to do that because he says in verse 17, they shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed. Who? Those that trust in graven images that say to molten images, ye are our gods. In other words, God warns against idolatry. It is shameful to put your trust in those things. Jesus to become some baby stuck in a manger somewhere. Then you have a false view of who he is. Man, he is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. And we need to understand that and not fall into some idolatrous view of who he is. Verse 18 to 20, God warns of Israel's 
uh, error, their stubbornness towards God genders a deep, entrenched spiritual ineptness in them. They become trapped, they become imprisoned in their idolatrous religious practices, and before you know it, they are in line for the ultimate judgment of God. And he, he basically says they see things, but they don't really observe. They, they hear things, but they don't really pay attention. And God says, I don't like it like that. So he gives the ultimate re rebuke there in verse number 23, uh, down to verse number 25, when he says, you know, verse number 23, who among you will give an ear, who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Uh, now, that was a prophecy. Of course, now we know the time has come. Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? When they went into idolatry, who's the one that judged them? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned, for they would walk, would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his laws. Therefore he hath poured upon them the fury of his anger, and the strength of battle, and he has set them on fire round about, and yet they knew not, and it burned them, and yet they laid it not to heart. In other words, their idolatry had so hardened their heart, they'd become so callous in their view of who God is, who they were, how they're going to make it on their own way, um, that, that they could not even recognize when they were experiencing judgment in their life. And when I think about the nation we live in, and the burning lusts of wickedness that are in the hearts of men. Uh, again, verse 23 calls, come back. Verse number 24 says, make no mistake, God will not bear sin forever. And again, the problem with sin in verse 25 is it desensitizes us. It deadens us spiritually. It, it destroys us in our relationship with our creator. And all the while, because we are callous in our heart, we are cold, we are dead spiritually, we think things are going just fine and we'll be all right. And those who reject the Messiah and those that go merrily on their way, rebellious in their sin, callous in their waywardness, oblivious to their own shame and injury, they are like drunken fools who just keep plowing forward to their own ruin. Now, many today are consumed with wicked passions, desires out of control, the results of their sinfulness. They're on a dead end road to their own damnation. They're stubborn and belligerent. They're oblivious to the coming day of judgment, cuddling the baby Jesus, but all the while rejecting him as the savior. The problem with that is just as God promised he'd come as Messiah, he also promised he will return as the conquering king, and he will judge men in their sin. So let me close with just uh, chapter 48 of Isaiah that says this, verse 17, verse number 18. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way thou should go. Verse 18, oh, that thou hadst hearkened unto my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. If you would have just listened, if you would just listen to the music, the lyrics of the Christmas music, I'm talking about Christ-centered Christmas music, singing of the Messiah. If you would have just listened and embraced the message of the joy that's brought by Messiah to the earth, then you, would have, then you would have had peace. He would have ruled your heart. And the scripture tells us that, that if we will turn ourselves over to him and commit ourselves to him, he will give us his peace. The peace of God shall guard our hearts, the book of Philippians says. And he says, your righteousness would be as the waves of the sea. You see, when you embrace Messiah, what happens is, according to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he was made to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And when you accept the Messiah, God cleanses you of your sin, forgives you of your sin, and he imputes to you, gives you what you don't deserve. He imputes the righteousness of Christ to you. And 
Romans chapter 3 says, but now the righteousness of God is revealed. And it's that righteousness which is brought by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we put our faith and trust in him, God takes our sin away and he puts Christ's righteousness on our account. And then he looks at us through the lens of his son who is always making intercession for you and I. So this Christmas, when we think about this Christmas child, think about this. He was more than an innocent, powerless baby in a manger. He was the promise of God. He was the anointed Savior. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the one you will have to deal with sooner or later. And I suggest you do it now. Better now in His grace than later in His judgment. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name given among men, given under heaven, given among men, whereby men must be saved. Only through Jesus. John 12, 1, 12 says, but as many as received him gave you power to become sons of God. You can be saved if you'll embrace him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 13, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe in your heart that he is the Messiah, that he died for your sin. He took those sins to the grave, rose again so that you might have new life. You embrace that truth, believe it with all your heart, and confess him as your Lord and Savior, and you will be saved. First um, John 5, 11 says, this is the record. God has given eternal life, already been given, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. It's that simple. Embrace Jesus, and you'll have the merriest Christmases from now on. God bless you. Merry Christmas.